I would say that environmental challenges are fundamentally human and social challenges in the sense that they are caused by humans very often, and they're certainly defined by humans in the sense that we're talking about them. So ultimately, um, ESSH is, is of central relevance because environmental challenges are social challenges. Transformative change suggests we need kind of deep structural changes in how we organize our societies, our politics, our economies. Um, and I don't think that we can do that without the social sciences and humanities. And particularly the environmental sciences and natural sciences have been really successful in really analyzing the problems we are facing um, with respect to climate change, biodiversity loss, water issues. So we, we're really good in the moment in painting the, the problem space so to say. In terms of finding solutions, we now also have an impressive men menu of different solutions on the table. But what we also know is that all of these will um, entail varying kinds of trade-offs. In those discussions about where we'd like to go, uh, the social science and humanities, I think, just offer a, perhaps a better starting point for having those conversations, because we can start to understand what matters to people, what do, what do people out there actually value? What do they care about? Um, and how can we engage with their concerns uh, when we think about where we'd like to go to address environmental issues? We have an absolute wealth of history, literature, art that gives us insight into how people have responded to uh, times of fear, um, to disasters, to losses, all, all of those things, I think, can be really interesting for the psychological and emotional um, aspect of fear of climate change, loss of biodiversity. Uh, so I think that is something that the humanities are very well placed uh, to analyse and to see how people in the past have connected the present to their idea of the future. The whole way that we think about ourselves in the world and, and what we ought to be doing, our systems of value, our ideologies about how humans ought to live. All this is very um, kind of deeply entangled with very distant pasts that I think you need um, historians and um, literary people and, and all kinds of expertise that's, I guess, rooted in the humanities to try and understand and explain. Um, and I think that the more that we understand that, the more it's possible to to kind of unravel it and, and start thinking a bit differently. I don't know, do we need to think of climate climate research kind of 2.0 where, where the game changes completely and suddenly we have humanities and social sciences at the centre of trying to transform societies for resilience and, and kind of a, a, a rapid... Um, the sort of rapid transformation that that the kind of techno fixes can't do on their own. I mean, if you come up with a if you come up with a science based solution and people don't accept it, they don't understand why it needs to happen. They don't want the discomfort. Um, they don't want the expense. Then it's all very well having the solution, but it's not going to work fast enough and to scale. Traditionally, and still today, disciplines are very kind of narrow. So, for instance, even in when we have to write our own proposals, there's lack of interdisciplinary platforms. Everyone talks nowadays about interdisciplinarity, but then you're going to submit your proposal, I don't know, to the Natural Environment Research Council. The, the funding agencies and the funding available is kind of very niche. It's It goes either for social sciences or for natural sciences, but there is no a lot of uh, platforms in which you can uh, uh, propose new ideas in which you can then foster interdisciplinarity. First, I think funding is a, is a, a big challenge. Um, a recent paper estimated that there's been more than 700% more funding to the natural and technical sciences than the social sciences. Collaboration across disciplines is very time consuming, I think, to really um, do it well. And so often in our projects, we're very time li limited. And not only that, but the time frames for each discipline may, may be different. One of the main barriers is, is this lack of communication between the different disciplines. And, and at the same time, the use of the different language and not different language as a spoken language, but uh, about what we want and what we mean with, with our research and with the things that we do. 
Um, so I think that, that part of the problem is that scientists don't know how to listen to humanities people. They don't know what to ask of us and they don't know how to receive it when we, when we try and communicate it. And I think some of this is just a matter of sitting down together um, and perhaps thinking of, of all disciplines or as, as sort of equal partners in this rather than as something more ancillary to others. In some parts of the social science community, um, there's a feeling that, well, we know the climate is changing. We know what's required to adapt. But that may be true at the global scale, but at the regional scale, often there's a very poor grasp of exactly how the probabilities of extremes are changing. And so what happens then is that you have people that say, well, the climate science is done. We just need to adapt. And then you have projects which are funding all of that work, trying to use models which don't actually provide the appropriate data. And then there's this unwillingness to fund the, the core climate science, for example, which is needed to help inform um, better adaptation projects. I think there's also a deeply rooted assumption about the value of different kinds of knowledge um, with kind of conventional scientific and technical knowledge being more highly valued, I think in part because it more easily fits into and contributes to the kind of dominant modes of economic and political organization. You don't want, I think, research to be valued by how much money it brings in necessarily, because if you do, then the SSH tend to be actually relatively cheap, um, which would seem to be a good thing because it makes it relatively easy to fund ESSH research. I mean, this is a big generalization. That's not always the case, but, um, and so, but then it would be ironic if actually that makes it, gives it less of a voice because, you know, what's being valued is what's bringing in, you know, a lot of money. There's no doubt that um, for some scientists, the virtue of the humanities is to package up the data that they supply and present it in a user-friendly way. I'm wondering how the environmental humanities in particular can get upstream of that and start to engage in the concepts that scientists themselves use, the ways they think, the, the sort of epistemological models that they are assuming. Creating the right platform, so doing workshops and then just including people. So if I'm going to write a, uh, a workshop and it's more natural sciences, not, let's invite people from social sciences and humanities to bring and not just one or two, just try to think always what they can bring about that. And doing participatory workshops with social scientists and, and, and natural scientists and then involving also uh, citizens to to, to get a more holistic view. And I think the results of those studies are actually more beautiful. Well, I think natural scientists could definitely help the SSH community in being more action oriented, or what to even say solution oriented. So here is a problem, how do we solve it? Um, but in turn, the ESSH community could make the natural scientists ask the big ethical questions about how do we organize our societies? You need people in the middle, I call them bridging people, that can bridge between the disciplines and that can bridge between stakeholders and, and academia because they can speak enough of the other person's language to make that bridge. And that requires, as, as a colleague of mine said, a bit of intellectual humility because you will not know, you will not be the experts in any of these, but you will, will need to be the expert in Bridging. So sometimes we don't know what the other parties are doing. So we don't know what the, the social scientists are doing uh, and they don't know what we are doing while probably we're working exactly with the same people and in the same locations, you know. And I think kind of these kind of workshops or seminars that involve that, that are widely available, let's say at the university and that involve different parties uh, would actually bring us um, closer together. Somehow creating more time, I think, is the, is the, key, um, the key challenge. And, uh, you know, from my own experience, uh, it, it's really helpful when you have social scientists that are sympathetic to a physical science understanding the world, of the world. And similarly, uh, natural scientists who are sympathetic to uh, social science understandings of the world. I think a large part of it is starting to foster relationships between individuals across uh, you know, so natural science and into to social science and humanities. 
Where are the organic points of connection? Are the chance encounters, you know, the spontaneous exchange of ideas? Um, I think the spatial design of our um, university setting is important um, and sometimes militates against that sort of spontaneity of exchange. Uh, and it can even be reflected at times in intentional ventures like the One Networks and other online aggregations of scholars working in this field. The other one is... I would call epistemic charity. Here, essentially, the idea is that we need to be more generous in how we engage with other people's work uh, and look at it for what it's trying to do rather than judging it against our own standards of what we think is good. For that, we also need to create more collaborative spaces. And that's where I think also a lot of the arts and arts can come in to create these collaborative spaces where people can take some of their pure disciplinary intellectual um, armor off um, to, 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 to become, to come together in different ways. Um, as I say, to create more than the sum of the parts.